having it play tested. Those two are not necessarily um, following each other in any order. And play testing is not really the same thing as beta testing. Oh, here we're looking at plants versus zombies playing along. A game should have been play tested long before it is beta tested. Understand that. You should have put in the fun and done some fun quality assurance before you have your beta testers beta testing your game. Beta testers must be testing a game that you believe is already fun. Okay, what is play testing? Play testing is, in fact, playing a game. And playtesting can be very much enjoying the game, and those of you who have done some playtesting may have enjoyed the games that you playtested. Playtesting, however, can also be hating that game. It may not be fun for the player. Playtesting is the best process we have for finding out what is fun and not fun about a game. That's a quote from me. All right, why should you play test? Well, you're a game designer. You can tell if your game is fun, right? Um, unfortunately, and this is critical to us, fun is an opinion. Fun requires human judgment. We have no instrument that we can hold up to something and say, mm, that's fun, except for a human brain. We need to engage human brains to measure that. And the game designer is just one human, no matter how spectacular a human you may be. Another reason to get play testers. Say this is the universe of game players who may be the audience for your game. You've got a whole lot of game players with medium game playing experience. Some game players with not so much experience, and a whole few pl game players with a whole lot of playing experience. But most of them are kind of in the middle. If you're a game designer, you're probably way over there. You are probably someone who has a whole lot of playing experience, and your approach to looking at a game is not going to be the same as these people over here, the greatest portion of your audience. These are the opinions you really need to get in deciding how much fun your game is. Now, you can do some self-testing. In fact, while you're a game developer, you will play your own games. And I certainly hope you do that in this class. Although I know some of you don't because you've turned in games with some very bizarre bugs in them that are very easy to fix. A few of you have. You will find the opinions of others to be very valuable in your game development. There are downsides of self-play testing. Often you cannot see your own faults. As wonderful as your idea of fun may be, it may not be shared by all of your playing audience. You can get friends to play test your games. The upside is friends will gladly test early versions of the game for you. The downside is you cannot rely on the objectivity of your friends. They may give you harsher or insufficiently harsh criticism than your game deserves. Eventually, sooner or later through the course of time, you must engage strangers' brains in measuring the fun of your game. The question is, whom should you get? And that whole universe, that whole world of human beings out there, who should you select to be your play testers? There are actually some important guidelines given in your textbook that will be helpful to you. First, you may find play testers at community organizations. 
Guess what organization is depicted in that photograph? A community college campus is a great place to find game play testers. And I think you all know where you can find one of those. But out of all the possible candidates, who should you accept as a play tester? Turns out you do not want to get the very best game players in the world to play test your game. Maybe a few of them would be useful, but that's not your target audience. Skill can be kind of nice in play testing. It's not essential though. You need play testers, this is important, who can articulate well. You need play testers who can explain with words what's going on in their brains while they're playing your game. Because play testers don't just experience your game. Their brain does experience fun, but if they can't describe what's happening, their feedback is not useful to you. So who should you accept? Well, if you're calling up some play testers, if they cannot handle a coherent conversation on the phone, that play tester is useless to you. Even if he or she has mad gaming skills. Okay, it's good to try for a cross section, a diverse cross section of your target audience. Who you expect to purchase your game is who you should get to play test your game. So when you're conducting a play test session, get your play testers together and introduce the game to them. Let them know you'll be watching them play your game. Maybe have some warm-up discussions. Ask them what are your favorite games. Get to know what their idea of fun might be. Ask them why they like those games. Make sure they're able to describe fun experiences for you. Then comes the meat of the playtesting. You observe gameplay. It's good to do maybe 15 or 20 minutes for each playtester to start. Ask the playtesters to think out loud while they're playing if they can. So they will explain to you why they're doing what they're doing. If possible, use a one-way mirror so that maybe they can forget that you are observing them. Here we have uh, play testers playing a game right now and pretend you are looking through the one-way mirror. I would ask you to think about what those play testers might be experiencing as they are playing that game. And perhaps we will discuss this in this week's online discussion. You will want to discuss the experience, which should be, after they're done playing, another 15 or 20 minutes. First, ask them for voluntary feedback. If they have something they are itching to say, let them say it immediately. Then you can ask some probing questions. And here's where you need to have put some work in ahead of time. You should prepare some questions. There are some suggested, suggested in your textbook and a homework assignment this week will be for you to develop some of your own. For example, what were your overall thoughts? Could you learn the game quickly? What did you like about the game? What did you dislike a game? What was confusing to you about the game? Those are some of the questions listed in your book. Um, I'm going to ask you to come up with your own this week. Now, playtesters may be reluctant to speak, but if they are the articulate people you hope they are, you can get them to speak. The game designer has to get into their brains and discover the truth. You must get through those playtesters who are trying to shield you and protect your feelings. Now, at the same time, you've got to have a thick skin and you've got to let them know you have a thick skin and that you can take criticism. Because criticism can be a very harsh thing to experience. Artists of all kinds, whether you're a painter, a writer, a filmmaker, a game designer, any type of artist, 
you're going to have to get used to criticism. Especially with the internet out there, there will always be someone who will express hate for whatever you make. It's very important that you listen closely to your playtesters. Do not lead them. Leading them will taint their feedback. Nevertheless, someone's got to lead the discussion. And it will often fall to you, unless you're in a big corporation that is hiring a playtest company. So, your book and this lesson are going to provide you with some tools to help with this process. For example, the Play Matrix is a useful discussion tool that helps get the uh, players oriented and thinking about how the game works. This Play Matrix has two axes. At the top of this, of the vertical axis, mental skills, and at the bottom of the vertical axis, physical skills. Every game will fall somewhere in this spectrum, highly physical, highly mental, or half physical and half mental, somewhere in there. And every game will have some skill involved and some luck involved. If it's all skill and no luck whatsoever, it'll be on this side. And if it's all luck and no skill whatsoever, it'll be on that side. Let's think about examples of what would fall onto this play matrix. Some games you may be familiar with, like basketball, highly physical, highly skill-oriented. There's not a whole lot of luck involved in basketball, and there's not uh, as much mental involved in basketball as there is physical skill involved in basketball. There is some mental skills, though. It's not zero. Bridge, however. If you're playing bridge, extraordinarily mental. There's very, very little physical skill involved in playing the game of bridge. There is a little bit of luck, but a huge amount of skill involved in playing bridge. Craps, however, extremely mental. There's very, very little physical involved in a game of craps. But it's a lot of luck and not a whole lot of skill. Just a little bit of skill involved in shooting crabs. Whack-a-mole. There aren't a lot of games that are super, that are very highly physical, have very little mental, and a lot of luck, and not a lot of skill. But whack-a-mole is an example. There's a bit of skill involved, lots of luck involved, lots of physical, not very mental to play whack-a-mole. I would say evil clutches, since the bad guy is pretty much controlled by random number generators, definitely has a luck component, but there is the luck component of evil clutches, I would say, is high, but there is a skill component to playing evil clutches. The physical component. I'm saying dominates the mental component, but there is mental skill required to play the game. I would say that um, Galactic Mail falls kind of in the middle. It's since the motion of the moons and asteroids is a random number generator, there is luck involved. Um, there is mental skill, there is physical skill, there is luck. And I think uh, Galactic Mail is a pretty good example of a game that's in the center. Um, another game in your book, Koala Brait. Everything is pretty much deterministic. I don't think there are any random number generators used in Koala Brait, so there's very little luck involved. It's a highly mental game, but there is some physical component of controlling your koalas very precisely as you move them around. Um, so I'm putting Koala Brate over there, just slightly below bridge on the mental scale. Now, I'm going to ask you, which quadrant would include the game of baseball? Highly mental, highly physical, high skill, high luck. 
I'm going to say baseball goes in here. There is some mental component, but a huge physical component to playing baseball. There's a lot of skill required to play baseball, a little bit of luck perhaps to play baseball, but um, you are using many, many skills you must develop to play baseball. How about Tetris? I'm going to say Tetris is much more mental. There is a little physical component to playing Tetris, but a lot of mental looking ahead and thinking ahead. Um, there is some luck because the next piece to drop is randomly selected and can make or break your gameplay. But I'm going to say that it's higher on skill, near the middle though, and much higher on mental than physical. All right, and so that's a useful discussion tool. We'll ask you to consider games uh, online, to consider where you would put games in the online part of the class. And now let's look at another data gathering tool we might use. A Likert scale. Useful in discussions, useful in compiling reports of your play testers. For example, this is a Likert scale. I found this game to be excellent, good, average, fair, poor. Ask your play tester to select one of those. That's a Likert scale. You've probably responded to those before. There are other types of Likert scale. Rate this game on a scale from 1 to 10, with 1 being terrible and 10 being awesome. Or, this game left me blank satisfied, totally satisfied, mostly satisfied, somewhat satisfied, a little satisfied, or not at all satisfied. When Okay, when you use a numeric Likert scale, as we saw, you can calculate averages. If five of your playtesters rate your game as 8, 9, 8, 5, 7, then you could calculate the average of those five playtesters' ratings. 8 plus 9 plus 8 plus 5 plus 7 divided by five playtesters. They have, on the average, rated you as a 7.4. Why is that useful to you? Well, you could do comparisons. Say you did a play testing session in March, and you got that 89857 for a 7.4 rating. You took the feedback, made some changes to the game, did another play testing in May, and the ratings came back as 7, oh, that's supposed to be a 10 out of 20. 7, 10, 7, 9, 8 your average rating would be 8.2. Your game got better and while you made those changes. Yes! So everybody clear? Likert scale, very useful for collecting data on the opinions of humans about many, many things. Okay, we're going to do some play testing in class this week. And that's it for this week. Next time, we're going to be talking about prototyping games. Until then, this is Mike Substanley signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorraine County Community College.